Freelancers, I would say, are probably the most captivating and intriguing of all the characters within Red vs. Blue as a whole. They're the only group who, without fail, will manage to grab your attention upon hearing their name. The Reds and Blues might interest you more, but you don't actually care about all the Reds and Blues. You only care about these Reds and Blues. But when you hear Freelancer, then you know that's a limited number. There could only ever have been 50 of them, one for each state. So anytime one enters the story, you know exactly where they originated. Just over half of the freelancers we know who they were and what happened to them. So I figured I'd make a video where I go over every freelancer's history I possibly can and the subsequent fate of them and who's left. It's probably important to start where this whole thing began. The UNSC had found themselves in an interstellar conflict with the Covenant in what would be known as the Great War. With their superior numbers and technology, humanity, in almost every case, was overpowered, winning very few but costly victories. As such, they sought any means necessary to help fight back and ensure their survival. One of their methods involved utilizing armor enhancements, things like active camouflage, strength and speed boosts, temporal distortion, amongst many other quirky gimmicks were given a program to specialize in the study and development of these armor enhancements. Project Freelancer. The problem was these armor enhancements weren't able to run to their full effectiveness or even function properly without an AI to assist them. This is why Leonard Church was permitted the creation of the Alpha AI. Due to his doctorate in AI theory, he was the perfect man to head a program like this. He is allowed permission to flash clone his brain and create an artificial intelligence based on his own mind. Project Freelancer was named not because the agents themselves are freelancers free to do whatever job they desire, but because the program itself was free from UNSC oversight. They weren't being monitored and could almost be considered its own entity. By the looks of it, anyone could apply to be part of the program. It wasn't just limited to the 50 agents. Those were reserved for the best of the best, sort of. There were still soldiers, pilots, workers, scientists, and so on all part of the program. So the whole thing was of formidable size. The UNSC was actually very accommodating to the assistance of Project Freelancer in the very beginning. They had commissioned various simulation outposts to be built throughout the galaxy. Large quantities of red and blue soldiers were stationed at these locations, consisting of military dropouts and overall idiots unfit to serve the actual UNSC as a whole. These locations were places for freelancers to test and hone their physical capabilities, with each outpost providing a unique battleground and scenario. For example, High Ground was initially a base to practice infiltration and extraction missions. Its asymmetrical design always allowed for one team to be in a clear advantage. The large stronghold walls made it especially difficult to sneak past and get inside without ever being seen. In modern day, the base lay in ruin thanks to Agent Delaware. It seems during one of her missions, she wound up destroying the wall with high amounts of explosives, which she herself was caught up in as well. With the one integral part of the training base destroyed, the facility was abandoned and all soldiers stationed there were relocated. Speaking of simulation outposts, another prominent one was Rat's Nest, a secondary motor pool for Freelancer Command. The program was more suited towards sharpening a freelancer's driving skills. The facility circuit track made it an ideal setting for each team to utilize any number of warthogs and other vehicles available at their disposal to simulate vehicular combat. This was a particular hotspot for Agent Alabama, who spent most of his time in this one outpost as he enjoyed hunting the Sim Troopers from the back of his mongoose. That was until he suffered an unfortunate accident as he drove off a nearby cliff and was killed upon impact. From the time he spent here, he might not have been seen as that much of a bad guy by the Sim Troopers stationed here, as once a year, they pay tribute to him by sending a flaming mongoose soaring into the night sky as they watch it explode onto the rocks below, with tears swelling in their eyes. Agent Texas can be a little confusing to some fans, especially if you're a more casual viewer. She's both one of the earliest characters to be part of Project Freelancer, 
but she doesn't become a freelancer until a much later point in time. In reality, Agent Tex is an AI. She's not real. The Alpha, which was the only AI the director was designated to work with, was created from his own brain. Thus, the AI came with pretty much everything the original had, including the same memories. The death of the director's wife Allison was a memory the Alpha shared and grieved over. The Alpha was so distraught over it that in an effort to protect itself, it accidentally split part of itself off and created a byproduct, a fragment of the original. The Beta AI was all of the Alpha's memories of Allison, and when I say memories, I mean memories. They are his perceived version of his wife, a total badass soldier who can be quite intimidating if you get on the wrong side of her. This is Agent Tex, though she wouldn't be aware of it. This is also how the director would get all of the other AIs as well. Learning how Beta was created, he would traumatize the Alpha repeatedly to fragment parts of its being so he could attain more AIs and distribute them amongst the freelancers. It'd be a while before Beta became Agent Tex and joined the others in the program. But her story is quite heavily tied to Carolina, so I might as well mix the two into one. Carolina is the daughter of the director and Allison. And while much of her early life likely was heavily wrapped around her father's grief and pursuit of this program, her life with Project Freelancer actually doesn't begin until her adult life. In fact, her and Agent York entered the program together because they were a couple prior to becoming freelancers. They met at Club Arrera, a nightclub where York's friends abandoned him and left him all alone. When playing with his lighter, Carolina took it and started flickering it. The two hit it off immediately and formed a very intimate relationship. It's not really known why the both of them decided to join Project Freelancer, but they did, and they did it together. While Carolina's known for being a bit of a hard-ass during this era, she wasn't always like that. In her early days, she would go out drinking with a few of the other agents, and she and York would try to maintain their relationship, but not publicly. Considering her father ran the program and social relations weren't exactly encouraged amongst the agents, they tried not to draw too much attention to themselves, which is why their relationship likely fell through and they more or less gave up on trying to keep it going. In the early days of Project Freelancer, as can really be described about pretty much every agent, Carolina was fairly normal. The only thing that set her apart was that she was the best. She was the top-ranking freelancer, highly skilled in combat, a great leader, she cared for the well-being of her team, they could trust her, and vice versa. She was serious and commanding, as well as a little bit cocky. But she was still able to make some jokes every now and then. But when Tex arrived, that's when Carolina changed. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the director had a new favorite agent, and most frustrating of all, she was the new best. Tex's abilities far exceeded Carolina's own, and it brought out her inferiority complex, which Tex herself definitely wasn't helping. Tex would occasionally taunt her in a very smug manner. On missions the two were sent on, they would compete against the other for credit in its completion, whether that be obtaining the sarcophagus, trying to stop a traitor within the program, or simply just a training exercise of capture the flag. It was always a competition between the two, with Carolina growing increasingly frustrated over how seamless Tex always excelled. As she grew more bitter and cold, she was unable to truly see the bodies she was leaving in her wake. She became so desperate to become stronger, she abused the AI implantation process and demanded two AI be implanted into her to make her better. She was permitted this and is immediately eager to fight Tex. An unsanctioned match almost takes place, but the director rushes in and in a panic screams out Allison's name, which sends all of the AI into a wave of trauma. When no one arrives to help, Tex knocks her unconscious to make everything stop, and everything eventually settles down. This would probably be a good time to talk about Tex's view on Carolina, as it is fundamentally different to how Carolina views Tex. While Carolina always saw Tex as a rival she pretty much despised, Tex never really felt the same way. She never treated her as her rival. Ironically, not acknowledging Carolina as a rival only made her more upset. 
While Tex never knew she was based on Allison during this time, subconsciously there might have been something that always drew her towards her technical daughter. She was impressed that Carolina was willing to risk getting two AIs. Hey, that was gutsy. Hope it works out for you. When it does, you'll be the first to know. I look forward to it. When they go mad, she's very concerned over her well-being, which is why she knocked her out when no one came to help. What the fuck is going on? Somebody get down here! She checks on her health after the incident and advises North about the dangers she suspects regarding the AI. Tex was never really as hostile as she appeared on the surface. When it came to her job, she was pretty ruthless, but outside of that, she was very trustworthy. Which is exactly the reason CT left her a message about what she really is. While I haven't gotten to CT yet in this video, she was working to expose Project Freelancer for the crimes it was committing and uncovered the truth about what the director was doing and what Tex was. She considered Tex a friend, even if it wasn't reciprocated, and so left files behind regarding everything because at the end of the day, she was the most trustworthy. While Tex was waiting on Carolina to get better, upon hearing this revelation, she becomes enraged and goes rogue. She hatches a plan to break into the secured sector of the Mother of Invention and free the Alpha. Tex would fight her way through hordes of soldiers and even a few freelancers, including Carolina who has since woken up from her incident and just wants to prove herself better. Their confrontation would cause the Mother of Invention to crash land on a nearby frozen planet. Amidst the chaos, Tex accesses the ship's system in order to speak with the Alpha, but upon finding him, he's been fragmented so much that he's a shell of his former self. He doesn't recognize Tex at all and can only speak of how tired he is and wants to rest. With no time to spare, Tex must consider this attempt a failure and leaves him there but also because she spots Maine cornering a wounded Carolina. While she attempts to come to her aid, there's too much of a distance to be closed and Maine forcibly rips out Carolina's two AI and throws her off a cliff. Tex is both shocked and distraught by this, but heavily outnumbered, she has no other option other than to run. Carolina would survive this. She used a grappling hook and escaped without anyone noticing. Once she reached safety, she still felt like she needed a sense of purpose and so joined the UNSC as a simple soldier to help fight during the Great War. Humanity was still losing quite badly and so she forged her papers, went under a new name, McAllister, and spent the next few years in battle as she felt like she couldn't trust anyone anymore. As for Tex, her next appearance would be in Blood Gulch. Some time later, when Vic sends out a distress call on behalf of the Blues, Tex is the one who intercepts it. It isn't too long after her arrival until she once again comes face to face with the Alpha. This time around, he has a better memory of her, at least acknowledging that she was his girlfriend, but not enough to actually remember the truth. Tex, however, still knows everything. She can still see that he's oblivious to the truth, but there's really no reason to remind him and put him through all of that torture again. Instead, she chose to stick around and make sure he's okay. She joins the blue team and tries to help them take down the reds, which unfortunately, due to a great arm by Donut, leads to a plasma grenade blowing her up. She's still an AI, so she doesn't actually die, but it takes a much longer time for her to come back. About three months to be exact. With her core body gone, Omega, who was the AI she was always in possession of, gets loose and begins infecting random people. From this point on, when she gets a new body, she devotes herself to trying to destroy Omega. More freelancers would inevitably get involved when Tucker uncovers the simulation trooper conspiracy and Vic hires Wyoming to kill him. So Tex is not only protecting the Alpha, but begins protecting Tucker as well as she tries to stop Wyoming, Gamma, and Omega. There would be a small miniseries in between all of this where she recruits York to help her fight against Wyoming and find Omega as everything's become a wild goose chase. 
Short story is that he helped, but died in the process. But it was enough for Tex to gain more info on Omega's whereabouts, which only leads her back to Blood Gulch. Her search, along with a ton of other stories happening at the same time, culminate into Wyoming's plan to enslave the entire alien race. After Tucker kills him and all of his clones have dispersed, Wyoming tells Tex of his plan to end the Great War. While this has never been a major part of Tex's story, it was for Allison, and she is technically her. So agreeing with Wyoming's plan, she allows Omega to infect her once more, she steals Wyoming's helmet, which had Gamma, took Tucker's kid along with a green alien that was also there, and planned on using Junior to win the war. But Andy the Bomb had been placed on the ship as well, and was ordered to detonate. While Junior and the green alien jumped out, because of Wyoming's time distortion unit, the Pelican exploded, but didn't crash until one year later in Valhalla. As far as we know, that's what killed her once again. The soldiers stationed at the outpost would pillage the Pelican, but the Meta would then show up and ransack the outpost and steal her as the Beta AI along with all of the others present during the crash. As far as the original text goes, that's what happened to her. The her that appears in Season 8 was a byproduct created by Epsilon. Tex died along with all of the other AI during the EMP. For some freelancers, loyalty and reliability can be seen as their strong suit. For someone like Agent Florida, who we've never seen crack the top ranks of the leaderboard, he's also one of the director's most trusted subordinates. The most, some could argue, as he was put in charge of protecting the Alpha AI when in hiding. His time in Project Freelancer isn't seen much, at least from his perspective. He's often present during select missions, but not always assigned to a team. While the majority of the top agents are sent out to retrieve the sarcophagus, he is spotted during the mission briefing and right at the very end. It implies that he was there, sent to do something, but not the same thing as everyone else. He's also present during the raid of the Insurrectionist Longshore Facility and single-handedly takes down Chain Guy and Chain Girl while there. Afterwards, his responsibilities shift over to watching the Alpha. Florida would then drop his codename and start going by his real name, Butch Flowers. To cover up his disappearance, Project Freelancer sunk the state of Florida into the ocean. While his personality does come off as very friendly and down-to-earth unlike most freelancers, he's not exempt from displaying a darker side. When he becomes serious about his job, his emotions vanish. He becomes colder and borderline sociopathic. When searching for a leader to be in charge of the red team he would be up against, Sarge, at the end of it all, determines that Special Officer Lemons is not a real red and decides the only acceptable course of action is to kill him. When Lemons pleads for Florida to do something and save his life, he simply allows him to be killed in cold blood. A Agent Florida, I've got a situation down here. Thank you, Special you Officer have Lemons. You have class. found I us red. the perfect I am, I am red leader. Red. No, 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 wait, 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 please! That one's for Dagger Knife, dirtbag. Welcome to the roster, Sarge. And the same goes for Private Jimmy. The Alpha needed a body to inhabit and take over, and Florida has no qualms in stripping the life away from this soldier against his free will for the sake of advancing his missions. There's no sorry, there's no emotion at all. Your service is appreciated, Private Jimmy. He then hand-selected a group of red and blue soldiers and spent the remainder of his life ensuring both teams stayed locked in an everlasting stalemate, ensuring the Alpha never recalled his true identity or any events that transpired during Project Freelancer. His life would come to an abrupt end when what is best assumed as an allergic reaction to aspirin caused him to have a heart attack and die. A backup plan was put in place should something have happened to Florida. Freelancers California, Hawaii, Kansas, Montana, and Oregon were all on the list of replacements meant to take his responsibilities in Blood Gulch if anything befell him or he had to take up matters elsewhere. Unfortunately, Florida accidentally tripped over a cable connected to Vic 
which short-circuited him and caused him to replace the list of freelancers with a random assortment of sim troopers. This is the reason for Caboose, Donut, and Sister's arrival within the canyon following his death. Ironically, flowers would actually return to life. The aliens seem to have some sort of technology able to return the dead back to life. He is revived by the green alien who's trying to retrieve Junior, Tucker's kid, and his body gets possessed by Omega, but it only uses it as a vessel. Once Omega has no more use for him, it abandons Flowers' body and leaves him alive once more, though he does immediately get shot by a time-traveling version of Tucker much further down the road. So his revival is uneventful and short-lived. While Project Freelancer no doubt had noble intentions in advancing armor equipment and AI study, all for the sake of preserving the human race, there's no denying the outright illegal and unethical activities that went on behind the scenes as well. For the most part, pretty much every agent was none the wiser to what was happening outside of their own standing within the program. But there was one more observant agent. Connecticut, or CT as she's often referred to, saw how the director was driving a wedge between everyone, treating them like lab rats, more concerned over results than their well-being. This caused her to form a negative view towards him and the entire program as a whole. She was the only agent who suspected that perhaps they weren't as good as they thought they were. So she did some digging of her own and found files about the Alpha, what it was, how they were torturing it, how the director was breaking the law by creating multiple AIs, the truth about Tex's origin, pretty much everything. She knew this was wrong, how he was treating not only the Alpha, but the other freelancers as well, and so defected to the insurrection. While the Insurrection are technically a UNSC splinter group hired by Caron Industries, at the end of the day, they are part of the UNSC. She wound up forming a romantic relationship with the leader of the Insurrectionists and began feeding them information about Project Freelancer in hopes to bring them to justice. During her time, she manages to collect a lot of damning info about the program, but finds her main qualm in not being connected to the right people to turn it all over to. It's during a mission to a UNSC recycling station she fully defects and abandons the program. Everyone becomes aware of her turn, and an all-out hunt for her would begin. She's inevitably tracked to the longshore shipyards where she hopes to make her escape. This, unfortunately, wouldn't happen. Carolina and Tex intercepted the two, and despite CT trying to tell them of the director's actions, they refuse to listen, resulting in a fight which ends in CT being fatally wounded. The insurrectionist leader does manage to escape, where he dons her armor and alias in hopes to continue her mission. CT's final words are fairly confusing, to be honest. She possessed a lot of data about Project Freelancer, which she left a copy of for Tex so she could know the truth about who she was. Looking at everything, this should have been enough to convict the director of his illegal activity. But CT advises the leader to find an artifact hidden within the desert, that the information she had obtained pointed to some artifact and it would in some way be the silver bullet to put down Project Freelancer. The new CT would go there in search of this where he allied a group of aliens to help him find it, but he would inevitably die at the hands of Epsilon. The problem is, we never find out what the artifact was supposed to be or how it was supposed to end Project Freelancer. It's an ancient alien artifact that we know, but Epsilon gets uploaded into it and that becomes its main purpose. In reality, we never find out why the unit is important. Why CT couldn't use the information she already obtained is kind of a mystery. Agent Main was the brute of the group. His raw physical strength allowed for him to bulldoze and overpower his opponents with ease. His main combative problems came when he had to fight someone much more agile and quick than he was unable to keep up. He was a man of few words, very quiet and stoic, often letting his actions speak for themselves. But what many people don't remember about Maine was he was much like the others, the good ones I might add, more so than you might remember. 
Yes, he and Wyoming did use live ammunition against Agent Tex during a training program, but that may be because technically Tex was his enemy, and he may have just been following Wyoming's lead. While his attitude against his enemies was almost that of bloodlust, always going for the kill when presented the opportunity, as well as relishing in proving himself better than his foes, his dynamic on a team was very cooperative. He always tried his best to carry out a mission he was sent on, and while he was often left to his own devices, sent alone to cause mayhem and carnage, when in the field, he tried his best to protect them, coordinate, and be the tank. He even took a sniper round to the chest to protect Carolina. He was serious about his job as a freelancer for the war, and while he didn't often crack the top five, he was surprisingly dedicated anytime we saw him. Unfortunately, we don't get to see much of Agent Maine, because on that mission where he was shot in the chest protecting Carolina, he was also shot in the throat nine times by an insurrectionist soldier. Fortunately, Maine not only both managed to survive this, but also continued fighting on after, even if he did wind up doing more harm than good. His injuries completely took away his ability to speak. Carolina, having felt sorry for this injury, and as a thanks for saving her, chooses to give him the AI she was meant to receive. Maine was then given Sigma, the Alpha's creativity. Through him, Maine would once again be able to communicate, but little did anyone know what catastrophic results this would create. While the precise circumstances of what happened aren't laid out in a simple manner, by the way it appears, Sigma seems to have been a much trickier and powerful AI than anyone expected. Typically, upon receiving an AI, freelancers will experience slight headaches for a few weeks as their body adjusts to being enhanced, but Maine's headaches were stronger and didn't cease to go away. Somehow, Sigma was taking control, influencing him, doing something to his head to make him more susceptible to his own desires, stripping him of his free will. It's never stated how exactly he does this. It may be because Maine is portrayed as much simpler than the others, leaning into the strong brute whose mind isn't so sharp trope. Or perhaps it has something to do with how often he's shot and suffers blunt force trauma. But perhaps it's all just Sigma's doing. That intelligence is irrelevant, and any one of the freelancers who received him would have suffered a similar fate. Sigma became obsessed with metastability, the state in which an AI can be considered fully human, and he was set on attaining it. The method was collecting all of the Alpha's fragments and uniting them, the same AI who had been designated across the many agents of Project Freelancer. Sigma was consumed over this idea and corrupted Maine into becoming his very own puppet. His first real action just so happened to be on the woman who gave him the AI as a thanks. After Tex's break-in to free the Alpha, which crashed the Mother of Invention, Maine capitalizes on an already weakened Carolina who had been exhausted fighting Tex. He rips the two AI she had in her possession out from her body and throws her off a cliff. While Carolina would survive this, she would go on to feel incredibly guilty about what Maine became because she gave him the AI that was meant for her. From this point on, Maine began going by the Meta, a rogue freelancer hunting all the remaining AI fragments in hopes to unite them back into one. It was during the Meta's rampage that the UNSC subcommittee finally caught wind of Project Freelancer's questionable activity and launched a full-fledged investigation into the program. Amongst the Meta's accomplishments, he would successfully track down and kill Agent North, stealing Theta. He would retrieve Beta, Gamma, and Omega from the crashed Pelican after the events of Blood Gulch, get Delta from Caboose, who wound up being in possession of it, and came face to face with the Alpha in Freelancer Command. I don't mean to speedrun his entire hunt, but solely looking at him, his path and motivations were as simple as obtaining the AI that the others had. Yes, an AI like Delta was passed around quite a bit during his hunt. From York to Wash to South to Caboose, the meta was pretty much there the entire time tracking it, so summarizing his wild goose chase might get a little repetitive. Anyway, his goal eventually led him to Freelancer Command, where the Alpha was. This was a trap, however. 
An EMP was set off and all of the AIs he had in his possession were destroyed. Only one AI survived, Epsilon, the Alpha's memories, but he didn't actually have that in his possession. Following this absolute nightmare of a scenario, Wash and Main are then reprimanded by the UNSC, but given a chance at redemption if they recover and bring them the Epsilon unit. Main and Wash would then pair up and attempt to track down Epsilon. While a lot of back and forth happens with the group, having to travel from location to location and deal with the idiocy of many, things eventually lead to Sidewinder. A new version of Tex was born and was looking to find the director, which she figured the meta and Wash knew about. So she set off Epsilon's recovery beacon and the three had a showdown. Unfortunately for her, she fails to best them, and the meta, in hopes to regain the lost strength he once had, stabs Tex in the face absorbing her into the capture unit and begins using her AI to once again power his armor enhancements. With his newfound strength, he is forced to fight off the likes of Washington and the Reds and the Blues. Amidst the chaos, Tucker does manage to impale him with his sword, and Sarge has a surprise trick up his sleeve by attaching a warthog tow hook to his chest plate while Griff and Simmons push the car over the cliff's edge. The meta would plummet to the icy waters below and only die because of the holes Tucker punctured in his suit earlier. Water was able to enter the inside of his suit, and he drowned. His armor was then later recovered by Malcolm Hargrove, who hoped to better utilize armor enhancements but he's not part of Project Freelancer. As touched upon during Carolina's story, she and York met at Club Herrera before joining the program together. While they developed a very close relationship, upon entering the program, a clear barricade was formed between them as Carolina began taking things more seriously, foregoing all of her relationships and friendships in the pursuit of being the best. York, however, is one of the few freelancers you can say came out of everything largely unscathed. His experience within the program was mostly normal. He ultimately got accepted because of his locksmithing skills. He was the team's infiltration expert and excelled highly. He was consistently ranked 2 for most of his time, just under Carolina. He got along with pretty much everyone, always being friendly, he was a good agent in the field, he was overall a very reliable freelancer. He was given Delta, the Alpha's logic, along with a healing unit as his armor equipment. But things really began changing when Tex arrived. York, along with Wyoming and Maine, were the three agents meant to put her through a training exercise. Unfortunately for him, York is the only team player amongst the three. Wyoming and Maine would go off and do their own things, often resulting in unorganized defeat. But during their training exercise, Wyoming and Maine decided to use live ammunition, an act which is amoral to York, and so he tries to help Tex to ensure that she doesn't get hurt. Unfortunately, she's also not much of a team player, but despite the handicap, she still manages to handle herself. Things go wrong when Maine throws a live grenade, which winds up mere feet in front of York. Dazed and discombobulated from getting tossed around, he's incapable of reacting. But Tex saves his life by locking his armor so he can at least survive the blast. Fortunately, he does survive, though he is heavily wounded from this and would not walk away unscathed. His left eye was damaged and it would serve as a blind spot for him in the foreseeable future. But despite this, his attitude didn't change much. After recovering, he was still as cheerful and supportive as he'd always been. He'd accompany many of the freelancer's main missions without too many notable contributions on his end. But the more missions he went on, the more he found himself recognizing how frequently they were fighting against cops, being against the military. His faith began to waver. He was no longer certain if they were the heroes fighting for the sake of humanity. This is probably the reason he decided to help Tex when she went rogue. This along with the fact that she saved his life so he felt that he could trust her. He broke her into the facility, kind of, and tried his best in helping her complete her goal. He intercepted and fought off Wyoming, and even came face to face with Carolina. But when it came to her, as the leaderboards had shown time and time again, she was always the better agent, and he is unable to stop her. The mother of invention would inevitably crash, and York abandoned the program. He kept his AI and equipment and set off for a new life. 
While the months and possible years passed, in reality, his new life wasn't very glorious. He became a petty thief, breaking into buildings and stealing money. It was during this time that he had a reunion with Tex, who came to ask for his assistance in taking down Wyoming and retrieve her old AI. Since it's an opportunity to get back at Wyoming for being part of the reason he lost his eye, and as a continuous thanks for saving his life, he decides to help out. The two launch an attack on his facility and manage to take out the guards, but when they get into a firefight with Wyoming himself, Tex's gun jams and York goes in to cover for her. Unfortunately, Wyoming enters his blind spot and York is fatally shot. Tex would further advance and get more information about her AI, but York's body is left behind. A recovery beacon is sent off and Agent Washington would be sent to recover Delta. While Project Freelancer was a program meant to pair highly trained soldiers with experimental AI for the sake of humanity's survival, the director's methodologies were a bit… contentious. He didn't care much about the well-being of his soldiers so long as they got results. He was willing to push them both to their physical and mental limits to drive a fiercer competition amongst agents, even if it meant ruining relationships and driving a wedge between siblings. North and South Dakota were an extremely capable pair of twins. They are highly coordinated in combat together, oftentimes not even needing to speak, having that twin-like telepathy that we know they all have, indicating that they likely spent much of their life attached to the hip. They likely joined Project Freelancer together at the same time as well, but it seems that their combat prowess and coordination wasn't enough for the director alone. He wanted to test what would happen if one agent received an AI and the other did not. He could have done it with anyone, even some of the lower ranking freelancers who never had a shot of getting one in the first place, but he set his sights on both high ranking freelancers and a pair with an already established bond. Being in charge of the program, the director had access to each agent's profiles, and in it he saw the personality traits of both North and South and how drastically different they were. North is a very considerate and nurturing individual, while his sister is much more brash and defiant. Their personalities were polar opposite, yet they had a bond that most people would never know. To him, they were the perfect test subjects. To be clear, it seems as though South was more of the test subject in this scenario. Her personality is much more suited to evoke a reaction, positive or negative. Someone like North would likely be very understanding and not care much about someone progressing past him as he's much more caring about others over himself. But for someone like South, not being able to get an AI, would that push her even harder past her physical and mental capabilities to be able to compete for the role of number one? Would it produce a better soldier, or would she become worse and collapse in on herself? The director would get his answer. North was given the AI of Theta, a very childlike and innocent soul which was perfect for North's very nurturing and caring personality. This annoyed South, but it wasn't actually enough to do anything more than put her in a bad mood. What wound up pushing her further and further over the edge as time went on was the director himself. Like a carrot on a stick, he would constantly dangle an AI in front of South's face, believing it to just be within arm's reach, only for it to be snatched away. Impossible to attain. He would promise her that she would get an AI, only to give a different soldier one instead. He had her attend the AI classes when she didn't even have an AI to learn from. She was constantly placed on the precipice of advancing to the next stage without recognizing she was chained to where she was, unable to move up the ladder. The moment you could say she really snapped was after raiding the insurrectionist's base. She and Wash were scheduled next to receive an AI each, but Carolina wound up demanding she get both of them and her permission was granted. Yet again, seemingly right at the finish line, her reward is ripped right in front of her. These mental tactics the director implemented made South resentful, filled with hate as she saw all of her colleagues rocket past her. In a way, the director's plan kind of worked. South became so fiercely dedicated to the goal of attaining an AI, all of her actions were for this sole purpose. 
When Tex launched a break-in to free the Alpha, South saw her as a traitor. She was undeserving to be part of the program and given all the special treatment that everyone noticed the director was giving her. South was loyal, she was fighting for Project Freelancer. She was a trusted enough soldier to be given an AI. But when she wound up confronting Tex, North was there to halt her assault. The two do wind up fighting, but in the end, neither of them is killed. The mother of invention crashes, and exhausted from everything, North takes his sister and leaves the program. Hey, pretty good with that missile pod. Yeah, I'd be even better if you weren't using two sniper rifles, cheater. Okay, don't get a big head. You're still my little sister. Come on, let's get out of here. Hey, I've got your back. Always. And I'm watching yours. This would be the happy ending if things just ended here, but unfortunately, they don't. North did indeed leave the program, and while he took South with him, she did not. She still wanted an AI. While a few years went by with things seeming to be all well and good with them, by the time the meta goes on a rampage and begins hunting down freelancers for their AI, his path inevitably leads to North. While the twins attempt to fight him off, the meta proves to be too strong of an adversary, which leads to South betraying her brother. The details aren't clear, as we never see them for ourselves. but as the story would go, South apparently put her brother in a position to be killed, while the meta killed him himself and stole his AI. I suppose as a weird thanks, he knocked her out instead of killing her. After the storm was over, there did really seem to be a brief moment of clarity for South here, recognizing the horror of what she had done to her own brother. It doesn't last long though, as North's recovery beacon is set off and Wash arrives. Seeing the meta as a villain, Wash decides to team up with South to take him down. He winds up giving her Delta to set up a trap, but after she gets the AI, her mission is accomplished. While Wash fights off the meta, South shoots him in the back. She radios Freelancer Command, telling them that she got the AI, but then goes AWOL and abandons the program. She finally got what she wanted, or what the director made her want. This only lasted a few months though, as she was continuously hunted down by the meta. Her fate is that she winds up getting shot by Caboose, and soon after, executed by Agent Washington. While we all know Project Freelancer in the show for dealing with the best agents, utilizing their cool armor tricks, what we don't see are the early stages before that. Considering the program was designed to specialize in armor enhancements, one of the freelancers we can likely thank for getting a lot of the equipment up and functioning is Agent Utah. In a Season 9 deleted scene, he is testing the domed energy shield armor enhancement, which we know later would wind up in the hands of North. The test doesn't go very well, due to not possessing an AI to run the equipment. The bubble shield only covers an area around his head. He isn't able to deactivate it fast enough, and almost suffocates as a result. We can assume it was probably his job to test out everything and see how they function without an AI, since that was a very careful selection the director only gave to a few people. Before Project Freelancer, Agent Washington, or David, was a normal soldier enlisted in the UNSC during the Great War. After completing his basic training, he became an army corporal, and while he and his squad spent much of their time traveling from system to system, one day they were attacked by Covenant. The sergeant pretty much ordered everyone to their death, but David chose to disobey orders and save his squad's life. While he was successful, he took his frustrations out on the sergeant, which resulted in him being court-martialed for the incident. Following this, David applied to Project Freelancer, as there was nowhere else that would accept someone with his history. After undergoing a psych evaluation by Counselor Price, he accepts him into the program and designates him under the codename of Agent Washington. In the beginning, he was a pretty terrible agent, to be honest. Try to remember to pull the pin before you throw your grenades, okay? So some of his early time was spent being associated with a few of the other worse agents around. But it seems as though despite his rough beginning, he always had a lot of potential from the get-go, as he slowly climbed up the ranks and eventually broke into the top 10. 
Admittedly, he wasn't the most useful agent to have on the field, especially when compared to the others. He was more so the comic relief. He was an easygoing guy who tried to console his teammates when they seemed down, chatted with them when they were in the mess hall, and was more the person to hang out with. But that attitude of his changed real quickly when he was set to be implanted with the Epsilon AI. Up until this point, there had been minimal incidents regarding AI, but it seemed like problems were rising slowly but surely. And when Epsilon was implanted into Wash's head, things went wrong. Epsilon is the Alpha's memories, and one of the most painful memories the Alpha had were of his wife, Allison. It's why Beta was created in the first place. It was such a painful memory to have that it created a byproduct of itself. But Epsilon was just having the painful memories. It was being tortured, and torturing Wash at the same time. It was in so much grief that Epsilon tried committing suicide inside of Wash's head, which obviously wound up affecting him as well. He was quickly sedated and the AI removed but the damage had already been done. Wash's memories began to merge with that of Epsilon, causing him to continuously experience the pain and trauma of losing Allison. He was having trouble separating which memories were his and which were Epsilon's. Regardless of the truth, he all of a sudden found himself with the knowledge of what the director and project freelancer had done to the Alpha. This was information that no one was supposed to know. The director and counselor did fear that he did in fact gain Epsilon's memories, but Wash tried his best to hide the truth from everyone. Following this event, he became distrustful, cold, and bitter towards the outside world. His once easygoing and caring personality became cynical and distant. He harbored a grudge against Project Freelancer for what they did. Whether these were his own emotions or Epsilon's, it didn't matter much. All that did now was taking down the program from the inside. He continued to be an agent for the program, and after many left, died, or disbanded, Wash was given a new role as a recovery agent. It was his job to track down the AI now out in the wild and recover them, as well as their armor enhancements. He does recover Delta from a deceased York, and after getting into a small skirmish with Wyoming, is pulled to a new distress call from North and South Dakota. The meta has since tracked them down and killed North, stealing his AI, and South was recruited by Wash to try and put a stop to him. He hands Delta over to South to lure the meta into a trap, but is betrayed and left to die. He only survives the encounter by utilizing York's healing unit and pretending to play dead. While he was fortunate enough to walk away with his life, he is later brought back to Recovery Command and told to investigate the Omega AI, where his adventures with the Reds and Blues would begin. There's quite frankly too much story to detail for this one video. Basically the gist of what happens is that he winds up uniting both the Reds and the Blues to stop the meta. The journey inevitably leads to Freelancer Command where the Alpha is supposedly contained. Of course, as we know, Church is actually the Alpha, and Wash actually came here to retrieve Epsilon. This is the evidence that he intends to use to bring Project Freelancer to justice. Surprisingly, he leaves this task to the Reds and the Blues as he goes off to stop the meta. He winds up having a meeting with the director and counselor, where they learn that he actually did inherit Epsilon's memories and promptly gets stripped of his title as a freelancer. Agent Main is ordered to kill him, but an EMP is set off and his entire collection of AIs, with the exception of Epsilon, is destroyed. Following this, both Wash and Main are arrested by the UNSC, but given a chance at redemption and freedom if they bring them Epsilon. Unsurprisingly, Caboose did not turn Epsilon over to anyone. This leads Wash to serve as an antagonistic force while he and the meta tried tracking him down from location to location. After a long, wild goose chase, things eventually boil over at Sidewinder. Agent Tex has since been revived via Epsilon and tries fighting them to extract information. She winds up losing, however, and Main absorbs her into her capture unit and defects once again to his own team. 
Using her, he is able to once again run his armor enhancements, and Wash is forced to fight for the sake of his own freedom. During the fight, he winds up being badly wounded while the others wind up taking care of the meta. The Reds and Blues decide to thank him for past favors and patch him up and disguise him in Church's old armor. Also, the Blues were one teammate short, and so they wanted another one. Turns out their wild play was the correct one, as the UNSC arrived and retrieved the Epsilon unit, revealing that the chairman wasn't going to give Wash his freedom after all. Wash's story would go on a lot after this, actually. There's ten seasons worth of story, but I'd say from this moment forward, he's more so a blue. As a freelancer, he is no more. Agent Wyoming is perhaps one of the more underrated freelancers in terms of his skill and overall capabilities. He was ranked amongst the top four consistently, and when you look at what he's capable of, it's easy to see why. His sharpshooting skills are probably his most noteworthy ability. While his sniper seems to be his weapon of choice, he is able to hit many different targets regardless of the weapon. His time in Project Freelancer can actually be fairly confusing from the talkative, sarcastic British agent he's known to be. During the program, he was actually a very quiet individual, similar to Maine in many ways. In fact, both of them were probably the two most defiant agents as they decided to use live ammunition on Tex during a training exercise. While the stats are heavily in favor of Tex during this, to be fair, Wyoming was the only one who landed a shot on her the entire time. But despite his defiant nature, he did also seem to be one of the more social agents. He would go out drinking with the likes of York, Carolina, North, and Illinois. Being one of the top agents, he was given the Time Distortion Unit as his equipment, which allowed him to rewind small segments of time to get an upper hand or avoid an unfortunate accident and escape death. Gamma, the Alpha's deceit, was the AI to help him run it. Gamma seemed to be the source of a lot of change for him. For example, Gamma likes to tell knock-knock jokes, and after being implanted into Wyoming, he began as well, and it got on the nerve of Agent York. One of the more curious events that happened involving him is Tex's break-in. After she learns of her origin and sets to free the Alpha, rumors begin spreading, claiming that Wyoming had been attacked by her with the intent to steal his AI and equipment. She went rogue, broke out of the facility in order to save her precious AI. A little later, we found Wyoming. Apparently, she tried to steal his AI unit, tried to get his equipment too. That hasn't been proven. Many of the characters deny that this sounds like something that she would do, and they're right. It really doesn't make sense for Tex to try and take his AI as it was never part of her goal. So what happened with this? It sounds more like something Maine would have attempted as he had begun getting influenced by Sigma into becoming the meta by this point. A lie most certainly seems to be involved, as he's in possession of the Alpha's deceit. But to what extent? Did Maine attack him but he chose to lie and pin it on Tex? Or did Gamma deceive him and make him think it was Tex because he was in cahoots with Sigma? Or was the whole thing just a lie to begin with? Perhaps the director wanted to turn everyone on Tex and so he had him spread that rumor. We don't know, but whatever the truth of the situation was, we know Wyoming still fought for the side of Project Freelancer during Tex's break-in, even if he does get taken out by York pretty early on. Following this event, however, Gamma forcibly removes himself from Wyoming's head, which winds up affecting him heavily. It's probably the reason he becomes much more of a character compared to how he was in Project Freelancer. Years later, the Omega AI and Vic would wind up hiring him to kill Tucker in Blood Gulch as he learnt of the conspiracy behind the simulation troopers. This put him into yet another conflict with Tex, who vowed to protect Tucker and destroy the Omega AI. Wyoming was much more of a formidable opponent here, often thwarting the plans of our main characters. He even wound up reuniting with his old AI. Wyoming, Omega, and Gamma would then form a new plan. After killing an alien, which as far as we're aware is the only one Project Freelancer ever got, Tex recruits Agent York to help her stop him. Considering he had a bit of a vendetta against him for losing his eye, York helps out. But after raiding his base, Wyoming manages to kill York. 
He does redirect texts back to Blood Gulch as the Omega AI is more of a concern to her. He does have yet another run-in with Agent Washington who arrives and tries to recover the Delta AI from York's body, but while bullets are exchanged, no one is hurt and the AI is recovered. And the two go their separate ways. While Wyoming was initially hired to simply kill Tucker, his plans became much more purposeful as time went on. Remember the alien I mentioned that he killed? Well, Wyoming and Gamma were using him. Many people often forget, due to the amount of storylines and drama happening, that pretty much every freelancer agreed in wanting to end the Great War. It's why they joined the program in the first place. Many of the storylines that developed often have nothing to do with it. But Wyoming, his goal was to finally end it. He tricked the alien into impregnating Tucker and planned on using Tucker's kid to enslave the entire alien species, thus saving mankind. Things don't exactly go his way when facing the Reds and Blues, forcing him to use his time distortion unit to shift the odds into his favor. But the real problem comes in with Tucker, who has since come into possession of an alien sword, which prevents him from being affected by the time distortion. After luring Wyoming into a false sense of security, Tucker stabs and kills him. But that's not exactly the end of him, as clones left behind from all the resetting also exist. The majority do wind up getting wiped out, but the last one explains to Tex what he's been trying to do in ending the war. And Tex agrees with his mission. She winds up killing him and taking his helmet in hopes to fulfill Project Freelancer's plan. But in terms of Wyoming, his story ended there. Perhaps the most infamous freelancer has to be Agent Georgia. Initially existing as a character only heard about through word of mouth, Georgia suffered an unfortunate jetpacking accident in which after not following course correction, he was sent hurling into the depths of space and his body was never found. Even the best of the best are able to be taken out due to their own hubris, and I do mean the best of the best. Despite having never seen him in action, Georgia was ranked amongst the top 10 overall freelancers during his time. He definitely had an ego about it and wasn't against putting down those of lesser standing than him. As far as the canon story goes, his fate is left as having gone missing after his jetpacking incident. But in a deleted scene, we can see him crash into the window of the Mother of Invention in front of Agent Utah. They share a brief conversation before Georgia returns back to his fate of endlessly drifting throughout the vastness of space. Hey Georgia. Hey Utah. I found your lucky penny. Do you want it back? No, you can have it. I'm gonna go now. Later, man. Okay, bye. He does also have an easter egg in Halo 4 in which we hear him putting on the jetpack. Cool, jetpacks! That will help us get on that ship or my name is an Agent Georgia. But neither of those two scenes should be seen as his true fate. His legacy serves as a cautionary tale for the safety measures agents should follow to ensure their survival. While Project Freelancer is often known for consisting of the best of the best, so long as there are those reigning supreme at the top, there must be those who reside at the bottom. Agents Idaho, Iowa, and Ohio can be classified as the three worst agents in the entire organization. A large part of this can be due to the fact that they share much more in common with sim troopers, both in their general demeanor and overall stupidity. They'll often play silly games with each other and spend most of their time talking without compensating much for it physically. It makes it curious how they even wound up in Project Freelancer to begin with. It most certainly was a program soldiers could apply for, but to then be accepted in and designated with a code name, even if they weren't amongst the best, someone had to see something within them that had potential. Regardless of how the three of them wound up in the program, due to their similarities, they were dubbed the triplets by their peers. Unfortunately for them, it wasn't just their peers who thought they lacked what it took to don the moniker of freelancer. Those in charge did as well. To get rid of them, the three were sent on a special assignment to a remote snowy tundra in the middle of nowhere. 
It didn't take long before they realized that they were dumped here as cannon fodder with nothing to do and no one coming to rescue them. But to their amazement, they did find another group of soldiers also abandoned by their superiors. This group was ironically working for Karan Industries. While they initially bond over the fact that they were left for dead by their respective organizations, Agent Ohio specifically decides to antagonize and make an enemy out of them. The three story ends happily as they have finally found purpose in their roles and have something to do. As far as we know, they're still fighting a meaningless battle for the sake of their own satisfaction. Illinois is one of the more notable side characters whose life we hear about after Project Freelancer. He was the demolitions expert amongst the group, however, wasn't quite as noticeable as everyone else vying for the top positions within the program because unlike everyone else, he wasn't as ambitious nor competitive. He didn't care about getting an AI, and as a result, he never screwed any of his friends over. He was just good at his job and looking to a brighter horizon after everything was over. He would often speak of his dream on living on an island chain in a shack by the water with a bar full of spiced rum and a tiny red sailboat. After Project Freelancer collapsed and the war had ended, he fulfilled that dream of his. But there were those who were left unhappy with what the UNSC had done to them. After Project Freelancer had fallen, all of the simulation troopers fell back under the jurisdiction of the UNSC. And to wipe clean the slate that Project Freelancer potentially would have left on them, they ordered the execution of every remaining sim trooper still active. When orders stopped coming through, one group of blue and red soldiers ventured away from their outpost to investigate what went wrong. They wound up at the off-site storage facility and accessed records which detailed how every simulation trooper was sold out by the UNSC to be used by Project Freelancer as well as the order to kill them all. This information pissed off this group so much that they decided to declare war and seek revenge on both Project Freelancer as well as the UNSC. Together, they rallied every single sim trooper still alive to their side and formed an army. They built their own base under their outpost and began launching several attacks on select military bases. In terms of revenge on Project Freelancer, the organization had clearly fallen by this time and was non-existent, but the agents that used to be part of it were still out there. The Blues and Reds salvaged several pieces of technology the program had used, such as Armor Lock and a way to track each agent's recovery beacon. Using this, they managed to find various former freelancers and, donning a friendly demeanor, lured them to their base. Once in, they would armor lock their suit and leave them for dead. The agents who fell victim would slowly starve to death over the next several days, unable to do anything to save themselves. This is how Illinois died. It seems regardless of every freelancer's individual actions, some will see them all for the worst of what others did. He was not the only one who suffered this fate. Agents Arizona, Maryland, Alaska, along with six other unidentified freelancers all fell victim to this grim fate. Fortunately, before this group could rack up more bodies, they, along with all the remaining sim troopers, were all killed. Now, let's return to Carolina. I didn't exactly finish her story. While she spent years in the UNSC as a mere soldier, over time, she eventually shifted her views towards her father. While she spent so much time trying to earn his admiration and approval as a soldier and a daughter, she's come to the realization of just how wrong she thought everything he did was. The mistreatment of her and her friends, she hardly blames any of their fates on the individuals themselves. What happened to North, South, Maine, but most importantly York, she blames what happened to each of them and their deaths solely on the director. So she vowed revenge and swore to kill him. She recruited the Reds and Blues due to their history with everything at this point and used them to help her break Epsilon out of UNSC containment. Once again, I'm gonna cut out a lot of details about the journey she goes through to get there because much of it is just trying to find the bit of info that tells her where he is. The important development that does transpire during this time is character focused. In reality, she still feels as though she can't trust anyone. She doesn't trust the Reds, the Blues, or even Wash. 
In reality, she's just using them to get what she wants. Ultimately, it's Wash who forces her to reflect on herself when he refers to everyone as his friends. Carolina's so bloodthirsty and scarred from her past that she hasn't been able to differentiate who's trying to help and who's trying to hurt her. She and Epsilon are forced to head there alone, where she faces off against an army of Texas clones. But thanks to the good nature of the Reds and the Blues, they decide to give her and Church a second chance and risk their lives to assist them. After the chaos, Carolina is able to confront her father. After seeing the state that he's in, reflecting on herself and what she's become, her anger dissipates. She accepts that she needs to let go of the past and start a new future separated from who she once was. She kisses her father on the forehead and leaves him with her pistol as asked. She and Epsilon would then go on their own adventure for the time being, but like Wash, from this point onward, she's not much of a freelancer. Project Freelancer became a huge part of many agencies' lives and personalities. And as such, they live with what the program turned them into. Most, unfortunately, became the worst versions of themselves. They became obsessed with their rankings, their AI, they were mentally pushed to their limits until broken, their trust betrayed, with most of their stories ending in a tragic death. Only a select few got to find a new life and work to change on bettering themselves for the right reasons. Project Freelancer gave us a lot of cool fighters, but flawed characters who almost all went through some real hardship due to the selfish ambitions of one man. There's still many agents we never got to see, so who knows when more might pop up again. But anyway guys, that does it for this video. Thank you guys for watching. If you're interested in more Red vs Blue content in the future, then be sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you've made it all the way to the end, then be sure to like and share it with others. I would greatly appreciate that. But until next time, I'll see you in the next video.